to welcome to another episode of Sever Speak. We have Ryan Mulvaney with us today to share some crucial insights and useful tips from his experience as the owner of a very successful e-commerce company. Um, for those of you who don't know who Ryan is, uh, Ryan is the founder of Fiverr. Uh, it's a leader in Amazon marketplace optimization and he started his Amazon business, um, Amazon career selling used books and later on his, uh, he went on to develop, build his uh, brand and uh, he also launched many different brands, sold a variety of products including toys, books and uh, many other things uh, and Amazon has awarded his company, his firm um, uh, platinum seller status so that's like pretty huge um, and he's also helped many renowned brands build their business on Amazon over the years so let's uh, learn a thing or two from Ryan. Thank you so much for joining Ryan, it's a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. A great intro by the way, I, I, was, I was impressed with how much research you did but I'm most impressed that you pronounced my name right. Because a lot of people get it wrong. <laughs> Great. I'm glad that I pronounced your name right. Um, so, Ryan, do you want to just like um, take us through your journey of what got you started on Amazon? Yeah. Wow. I mean, you're, I, I, I don't know how I can, um, you know, go bigger than how, how awesome the bio was that you, you introed me with. But yeah, the journey started, uh, oh, it's 2020 now. So back in like 2008, it's about 12 years ago, um, got out of college, was sort of jumping between jobs. And my fiance at the time was a little bit, uh, she was like a year or two younger than me in college, probably two years. She graduates college and says, hey, I've got this textbook I don't need anymore. Sell it on Amazon. Um, you know, remember back in the day, colleges, you could just turn your textbooks in and you get money for them. It was like the coolest thing. It was this thing where like, at least for me, like my parents, like they, they helped me pay for college. So they would buy the textbooks and I get the money back for them. It was like this like little scam I had. But, um, you know, when my wife or my fiance at the time had this textbook, we put it up on Amazon. Um, I figured out how to do that. It sold very quickly, like the same night. And, um, I thought that was so amazing. I was like, wow, I just need to get books. And if I put books on Amazon, I'll sell products. And so my journey into Amazon was as a, as like you said, as a bookseller and I'd go to libraries and I'd, I'd try to help them with their donations. And I'd donate part of the money back that I sold on Amazon because the libraries, they could make like $2 a book and on Amazon, you could make like $10 a book, um, you know, and up. And so really learned Amazon from sort of that end of it, which, you know, it was a whole different marketplace back in the day. I don't even think Prime was a thing when I first started selling and I certainly wasn't leveraging it if it was. And, um, you know, Kindle came out and I was terrified that no one was gonna read physical books anymore. And I'm like, I need to diversify this little side hustle that I have. Um, and it wasn't supposed to be anything bigger than uh, funding my honeymoon. I actually called the store One Love Books and it was this way I was gonna make money to fund my honeymoon and then I got sort of hooked on selling books and selling stuff on Amazon. So I just kept selling stuff. Once I once I had the honeymoon paid for, I was like, well, what else can I pay for with Amazon? And, um, you know, from there went on to leverage that knowledge into an agency. But th that's a that's a longer story. Wow, that was quite a journey, wasn't it? And it's been quite some time since you started and uh, you've gone on to help many different brands as well. So uh, that's quite something. And um, so let's get straight to the questions, Ryan. Uh, let's uh, start the rapid fire. So, um, do you, do you want to maybe tell us about uh, five different mistakes that sellers usually make when they start out uh, advertising on Amazon? Five mistakes that sellers make advertising on Amazon. I need to take notes now. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so I think that you know, and maybe it's important to highlight. So after I got through selling books, we started an agency. And at the time, there was this private label movement that was happening. And what we realized was there's a lot of really good knowledge coming out of the private label community as to what you can do on Amazon. And we realized that the bigger brands in, in the United States weren't gonna be doing those things. So our tactic was to apply those things to bigger brands and sort of help them ramp sales. Yeah. Um, and so when you talk about mistakes, you know, we've seen all of them. And so I think the number one mistake that, um, people will make when it comes to advertising on Amazon is they'll advertise too soon. So they'll go out, they'll source the product, they'll put it up on Amazon. Maybe it doesn't have any reviews on it. Maybe the content's just sort of there, but they sort of put it out there and they're like, now we need to drive eyeballs to it. And so what they end up doing is they end up pushing traffic within their listing that it's just not gonna convert. I mean, sit in the shoes of somebody who's looking for a glass jar to buy on Amazon 
and here's your jar with no reviews at nine dollars and here's the jar next to it with a thousand reviews at, at eight dollars which one would you buy and so i think people sort of jump into it you know they get excited they launch products and then they sort of go um and so i think that would be the number one now if i have to come up with four more um i think that you know like i said turn it on too early turn it on without reviews on your listings turn it on without the right content on your listings Right. I don't know if we can blend those together to get to five. <laughs> um, you know, and then I think the other side of it too is that they just sort of like turn it on and then leave it there, like sort of set it and forget it. And, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you could, that's my daughter. I hope you can't hear that on the, in the other room. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, you know, the work from home life, I, if they get loud enough, I'll tell them to go be quiet. But, um, you know, I think it's this sort of like, oh, just put it up there, set it, forget it, and the sales will come in. And it's this very fluid process. I don't even understand the advertising anymore from where, where it's evolved from and, yeah. and where it is now. We, we have a whole team of people that, that do it. So, um, you know, and, and, and in that, like people will set it and forget it. And then they're like, I'll just, you know, if you can get this sort of ROI at, you know, $10,000 a month, we can get the same, we can expect the same ROI with $100,000 of ad, ad budget. And it just doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Right. Um, and so staying right. sort of dynamic with it. Got it, got it. And uh, have you sort of like uh, seen a pattern of what works with uh, many large brands? Because one of the things that I've seen, um, uh, you know, businesses struggle with after a certain point is that, that they hit the ceiling and they don't know how to, you know, like go beyond that. So do you know any um, anything that businesses can apply, like implement uh, to scale up? Sure. And are you talking about in the context of advertising or more broad, so for advertising? Uh, both. Okay. You know, one of the sort of unfair advantages that we have is because we work with brands, when we turn on advertising for a brand that people already know about, it's a lot easier to get an ROI. That's just the reality of it. There's trust built in, there's yeah. credibility sort of built in a line. And if the, if and if so-and-so product uh, company is, is offering a new flavor of something that people already love, it's that much easier to get the, the momentum going. So I think that if, if you're in the, the private label space and you're looking for sort of categories to go after, look at the ones that are, you know, I think you need to look at, if you want to go after a very competitive category, know who the big brands are in the space, look at how they're advertising, figure out the opportunities where you can maybe um, differentiate and offer something different and differentiation could be from a technology perspective, from an ingredient perspective, from a utility perspective from a price perspective, from a size perspective, there's so many ways that you can differentiate and offer something else to the customer. Because if you're going up against ball mason jars right here, this isn't ball, this is a whole pickle jar, but, oh, and this is the podcast, I'm showing people video stuff. Okay, I'm holding up a jar, but if you're going up against, you know, a very, like Coca-Cola, yeah. and then you're coming in with your cola, and if it looks exactly the same, feels exactly the same, and is the same price, they're probably not gonna buy yours. But if your Coca-Cola is organic, and it's got stevia in it and it's whatever, it's locally, whatever, it tastes a little different. Now you've got an opportunity to play. So I always think about how do you look at what's working and then how do you iterate or add in your own special layer to it that's gonna you know, allow you to, to, to be playing on sort of a different stage than them. Than them. Absolutely. So if you were to talk about advertising strategies for scaling up, what would you uh, say that would be? Um, you know, test and iterate. So you know try not to have too many moving variables or moving parts when you're running your advertisements because what i'll see is okay we turn on our ads and then we're gonna you lower your price 17 times through the month yeah. and, and so it's hard to know what's working was it the fact that you're advertising or was it the fact that you lowered your price um yeah. or you've swapped out a thumbnail a bunch of times and i think when you're in that sort of beginning stages of selling i remember we we have a, a private label product that we sell it's mm -hmm. a little uh little cast iron scrubber. And we we changed our main image after like three or four months and our sales like doubled overnight. Wow. And I was like, oh, people finally understand what it is because we gave context to the image. Yeah. And so I think those are the types of things where if we had like simultaneously changed our thumbnail and then turned on advertising, we'd be like, oh, we need to just keep spending on advertising because that's what's doing it. And so I think trying to create sort of static tests and you could do that sort of 
on a on a skew level. So you're like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna keep this skew static. We're gonna throw a bunch of ad budget at it, and then we're gonna keep this skew that's similar to it. This is the one we're gonna be messing with the thumbnail, and this is the one we'll mess with the price. And then ultimately, what you do is you 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 end up having like, all right, here's the ideal like sort of template for a main image. Here's the ideal template for a price point, and then here's how we advertise it. And then you sort of iterate from there, but. Just limiting the amount of variables, I think, is really, really key. Absolutely, yeah. So um, I, I was actually talking about this uh, in my previous sort of speak as well uh, with Emily. So I do think that when people, uh, when sellers start A/B testing, it's like really important to keep one change one variable at a time. Otherwise, it's it's just like impossible to measure the impact of uh, the variables. Awesome. So, um, and uh, PPC wise, um, are there any hacks according to you? I do know that everything's re like really relative, depends on the size of the accounts and the goals. Uh, but ha have you come across um, any strategies that have like always worked? It could be, you know, mix mixing different types of campaigns or, uh, you know, anything. Right, right. Hacks. Wow. I should text my uh, my uh, my ads guy about about secret hacks. And I do have a baby like screaming at my door over here. So if, if I have to step away for one minute, that I'm, I'm making the podcast better. I promise. She's trying. To, she's not. She's not big enough to open the door right now. Oh. Um, but, but she she's getting there. So at any point <laughs> she could. Um, when it comes to hacks, you know, I don't know. You know, there's there's definitely certain techniques that people will use. Um, whether it's looking at your competition and, and sort of bidding up on their brand names or bidding up on their strategic uh, listings, um, placing yourself actually on the detail pages of their listings. Yeah. Um, I think it just depends. It depends on what phase of the business you're in. If you're coming in and you're just trying to make a splash, I remember um, Rachel Ray, um, you, you know, for those that don't know her, she's, she's pretty, you know, famous. She has a cooking show here in the States, but she launched a, a pet brand, like a pet food brand. And I remember for like three or four months, she, you could not bid on anything like pet related, dog food, organic dog food, grain free dog food. She just was everywhere. Yeah. And so her hack really isn't a hack. She just threw so much budget at it. But what ends up happening is she drives in so many sales for those specific keywords that Amazon then rewards her with organic visibility. So she pays for the placement initially, and then Amazon says, oh, when people search for organic dog food and keto dog food and all these things, they wanna buy this product so that she gets all this, you know, sort of organic visibility. So at some point she could start tapering back on the, and I'm saying it like she's actually pulling the levers, that the, her company could actually start pulling back on the budget perspective. Um, and so, you know, I would, I would not suggest doing that in a large category like dog food. Um, and it's a it's a very expensive way to do it. But ultimately, if, if you then get, you know, a bunch of sales and you're able to get reviews out of those, you know, out of those products, um, you know, out of those sales, you can ultimately, you know, have quite a bit of visibility and get, and get that initial momentum. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other, I mean, really like technical hacks. Um, I'm sure I could get a few for you, but uh, it's above my pay grade. I have to ask our guys on our team <laughs> that do them. No problem. And uh, a frequent question that I get asked a lot, no matter uh, how much content is out there about addressing this question. So, um, how does one reduce a cost? How do they How do they review the a cost? Reduce a cost. Yeah. Oh, how do they use it? Like what? Like reduce it. So if it's like really high, how does one go about? Reducing it. Oh, reducing it. Reducing yeah. a cost. Reducing it. Yes. Yes. And again, a lot of brands will come to us and they're like, well, what, what should our a cost look like? And, you know, again, it depends on what phase of the brand, like what phase of the journey they're in. Because Rachel Ray, if we go back to her, they were not, a, they, they didn't really care. They just wanted sales. They wanted traction. They wanted like viability proven that people want to buy this product. And when they do, they're happy with it. Um, you know, in terms of actually like reducing your a cost, I think what you do need to do is uh, sort of double down on the campaigns that are working and you yeah. go out for probably more specific terms, less broad, less discoverability, like the ones that you're like, if you're selling, let's say a grain free dog food, bidding on terms very similar to that versus just dog food. Yeah. You know, so I, th I think specializing the terms so that you're pre-qualifying the customer, knowing that when they hit your page, this is exactly what they're looking for. 
as opposed to those people that are more in uh, sort of discovery mode because you know people do a lot of browsing on Amazon um, before they actually end up sort of converting so I think it's just you know trying to specialize and hone in on the on the, on the items that are that um, are converting the best but ultimately you have to decide where you are in the journey because if you want a ton of sales you yeah. need to be less sort of you know a cost sensitive Awesome, awesome. I completely agree with you. Um, so uh, let's just talk about off Amazon uh, strategies, right? Campaign uh, strategies. So as I'm sure you know, Amazon has uh, introduced Amazon Attribution Console, uh, which sort of unifies all Amazon, off Amazon and on Amazon uh, campaign strategies. So uh, have you used that and what is your experience being with it? Um, I believe the team has used it. I don't know their specific sort of experiences with it. I know that we've done quite a bit with DSP off of Amazon, targeted back you know, through sort of retargeting. Um, uh, you know, back in the day, we used to use the affiliate program as our own sort of, yeah. you know, way to, you know, do Amazon attribution. And so I know the team is doing it. Um, I don't know the specifics of it, um, but I, but it, it, it makes me very hopeful because a lot of times brands come to us and they say, hey, we want you, like net new brand, we want you to drive all our sales for us. We're, we're going all in on Amazon. And I'm like, well, what else are you doing? What are you doing on Facebook and stuff? Like, what are you doing to drive momentum outside of Amazon? Because Amazon can be a momentum driver, but it's also a momentum catcher. And so if they're not doing anything outside of Amazon, I, I get really nervous because it makes our job a lot harder. Um, and so, you know, having things like attribution, it's so nice because we can now quantify all right. Well, you know, even though maybe your 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 a cost on, well, my computer's going to standby. Can you still see me? Yeah, I can. <laughs> okay, my screen went black for a second. Um, you know, even though the efforts on Facebook maybe aren't quite as profitable as you think, if we can watch that sale come over to Amazon, um, yeah. you know, it allows you to sort of quantify the effort a little bit in a little Absolutely. bit more granularity. And I also think that Amazon gives preference to uh, products that are driving traffic from different sources. Like it, it always loves incoming traffic to Amazon. So I think it's like a brilliant strategy. It's like worked really well for us. So I try and uh, see how has it worked for other sellers as well. So that's, that's right. really great. And uh, I think we're almost up with our time limit. Um, Ryan, do you have any last minute advice for our sellers and viewers um, about how can they go about growing their business? Um, you know, look at Amazon as a very dynamic marketplace. Um, a lot of people when they're sort of getting into the, let's say the private label space, they, they go all in on their first product and they think that's the holy grail and this is the one they're gonna ride off into the sunset. And I had a, uh, in, a in a past life, when I first did private label stuff, we, I had this gummy vitamin that I launched and it, it, we grew it and it got to like, you know, like, I don't know, like 20 units a day. And I was like, this is amazing. And then I like looked at the ingredients and I'm like, I'm putting like sugar and junk into kids and I just don't feel good about this. I like exploited this opportunity and now I don't feel good about it. And so I shut that down, launched another product, probably shut that one down launched another product which we still sell today and then we launched a business around it and so i think it's just stay fluid and stay moving with the um you know the opportunity i think the other side of it too is if it looks like an easy path or a massive path just know that i feel like the things that can sort of come in quicker can also go away quicker i, I can't tell you how many people are hitting us up right now about hand sanitizers and face masks and gloves yeah. and I, I do think that there's going to be a huge new market for these yeah. but you know, I was at a I was at a local health store yesterday, like a grocery store, and a company that makes you know like powders, like nutritional powders, now has the hand sanitizer by the checkout. So everybody's right. getting into that category, and so I think that just you know again in in pre this whole you know pandemic, did you even care about hand sanitizer? Because if you didn't, maybe go after something that you actually have a little bit of passion for and you can layer in that 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 sort of x factor which is you to the product that is the thing that's going to set you apart where if you're really into selling glass jars on amazon but you're an artist and glass maker and you can infuse it with your little thing now yes. quantify that people actually want that right. but really focus on the things where you're going to be able to add in your you know your sort of special you know ingredient to it my i i do agree because uh, i've seen um two sides of the coin, you know, like um, private labelers who just source something for the sake of it 
and also brand owners who are really passionate about the products and uh, their work you know just goes to show how much work is put into their business so the private labelers who just like source any product um, that is sort of like cheap on uh, from China Chinese manufacturers and they sell it on Amazon they don't, they don't really like know much about the product and they sort of like use the same um, pictures that's been sent to them uh, and that doesn't really differentiate them from the rest of the sellers on Amazon so I definitely uh, think that's great advice uh, so thank you so much Ryan it was fantastic having you on the show and uh, I hope to have you soon again and uh, thank you so much you have a good day thank you so much for watching today um, I hope you liked it and uh, do give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel and I will be with you again soon with another amazing speaker uh, thanks again happy selling take care